Thank you very much. Big ideas for a brighter future. This is a beautiful theme, but there must be absolute clarity on a brighter future for whom and what really is a big idea or big ideas that will lead to that brighter future. The brighter future that I get up every day to fight for, frankly, is not charter schools. And it's not even the charter process. I'm a strong supporter of charter schools. But I believe that if we do not understand why charter schools exist in the first place, then it means nothing. I'm honored to be a part of this celebration of our 25th anniversary of the charter idea. But charter schools and the chartering process only has meaning for me if they truly serve the needs and the interests of our children, and in particular, the children of the families of the disinherited. Howard Thurman, in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, talked about the plight of the masses of people who live with their backs constantly against the wall. They are the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. He said that the doom of the children of the disinherited is the greatest tragedy. They are robbed of much of the careless rapture and the spontaneous joy of merely being alive. Through their environments, they are plunged into the midst of overwhelming pressures for which there is no possible preparation. So many tender, joyous things in them are killed without their even knowing the true nature of their loss. The normal for them is abnormal. They are likely to live a heavy life, a heavy life indeed. The big idea for a better future for them is ultimately not about the coolest new technology or a beautiful new building or even innovative teaching and learning practices. These things are clearly important, but the big idea they need help for, for them to have a brighter future is adults who are willing to fight for them every single minute, every single hour, every single day, every single week, every single month of every single year to do whatever it takes to change the trajectory of their lives. They need us to have their backs in the classrooms, in the community, at the state legislature, in the halls of Congress. This charter school idea took, took root because so many of us became dissatisfied with the unwillingness or the inability of the traditional public school system to educate a significant number of our students. And a disproportionate number of those students come from low-income and working-class families of color, the people who have their backs against the wall, the poor, the disinherited, and the dispossessed. Many of us believe that we could do better. We believe that innovation was necessary. We believe that we could not help our kids just by trying to improve the schools that we had. We believe that new schools were needed, new governance arrangements were needed. We did not think that doing more of the same things that we had always done was going to lead to a better result. So building on the idea of the creative and courageous people in Minnesota, some who are in this room, Ember's in this room, Joe is in this room, Ted is in this room, all of these people who made possible the first charter school law in 1991. And after that, people all over this country began to push for charter schools. The charter idea was best represented in the slogan, freedom in exchange for accountability. The call was for educators, parents, organizers, citizens, students to have freedom from some of the existing constraints and power arrangements of the traditional system 
in order that we might create new and better learning environments for our kids. In turn, these individuals would agree to be held accountable for results. The results being improved student achievement. This simple and straightforward notion of freedom for accountability became in many instances a powerful catalyst for creating new learning infrastructures in communities throughout this country. But as my friend Ted Goldery said, the innovation was not charter schools, it was the chartering process. The process that allowed for the creation of new governing models for public schools. So what has happened over these 25 years? I would say that if we are truthful, and we must always be truthful, even when the truth will be used against us. I understand it is hard to be self-critical when our opponents will use it against us. But as charter supporters and charter advocates, we must tell no lies and claim no easy victories. Ella Baker said, in order to see where we are going, we not only must remember where we have been, but we must understand where we have been. The truth is, we have much to celebrate, but we also have some things to denounce. We have developed some excellent schools and some terrible schools. We have very committed people who are doing heroic things to help our children, and we have had some scoundrels and crooks who have used charter schools for their own personal aims and in the process done harm to our children and the charter school idea. Maybe some of y'all are still out here slinking around this movement. We have had organizations who have put our children's needs and interests first, and we have others who have put profits or other interests ahead of the interests of our families and our children. We have had courageous politicians support the charter idea, and others who have relentlessly opposed it using lies and demagoguery at every turn. We have had organizations and individuals who have stepped forward and invested resources in creative ways to help advance the charter idea, while others have used their resources to block us with no regard for whether or not kids were being helped. We have smartly developed great new networks of schools that have helped us reach more kids, but it has also, in some quarters, led to rhetoric and funding strategies that have diminished the importance of supporting people who just want to create one great school for their communities. We have had people who respectfully refer to these schools as independent schools or one-site schools, but others have developed dismissive language to describe them like mom and pop and one-offs. We have developed some great organizations and schools led by white people while failing to understand the critical moral and political reason to ensure that we must also have great schools and great organizations led by people of color. Not, not just school leaders, but boards of directors that are controlled by people of color. And let me be clear here. We need people of all races in this struggle, but we will not be successful in the long run if the people who are most impacted are relegated to second-class citizens in the power arrangements to drive this idea. So we must celebrate the good and own the bad. We've done a lot, but there's so much more yet to be done, to be understood, and to be acted upon. For example, while we must, as charter advocates, focus on what we can do to make our school's vehicle for radically changing the life chances of our children, while we must constantly examine our practices in our schools, we must also clearly recognize the reality 
of the impact on our children's lives of the existence of differential power and access to resources in this society based on race and class, both inside and outside of schools and school systems. Race and class matter in America. <laughs> Children must see a society where their race will not be an impediment to their advancement and respect. Children must interact with adults who have not already reached conclusions about their capabilities because of the color of their skin or the clothes that they wear or how low their pants hang on their behind. There have been significant changes in the intensity of racial discrimination in this country since the March on Washington all those 50 plus years ago. But race still is a factor in American society. The massacre in that church in Charleston, South Carolina was about race. The killing of Walter Scott in that same state was about race. But class also matters in America. Poverty is debilitating to the human condition and the human experience. Children who are hungry cannot learn. Children who are abused and neglected are not going to be able to concentrate in school. Children need to see people in their immediate families working in order to understand the value of work and the connection between education and work. My friends, money matters in America. The only people who say money don't matter got money. <laughs> How money is used also matters. The practice of using precious resources to support what's done not, what does not work for our kids must be stopped. Whether it's the traditional system, charters, or tax-supported programs that give poor children access to private schools, if it don't work, it shouldn't be funded. Now, we have to walk a delicate line here, because although race and class clearly have an impact on our children's perceptions and their life chances, we cannot allow these conditions to be an excuse for not educating them. But also, we must not pretend that schools by themselves can overcome the horrific conditions facing our poorest children. And it is this struggle over some of the issues and ideas that in some way may be the greatest challenge for the ongoing sustainability of the charter idea. And I want y'all to hear me and buckle your seat belts. Our room where the charter idea lives must be huge. There has to be a place in the room of the charter idea for those who are warriors for black lives matter. There has to be a place in the room of the charter idea for those who focus on personal responsibility. There has to be a place in the room of the charter idea for those of us who see this as a social justice issue. There has to be a place in the room of the charter idea for those who see it as a market strategy. There has to be a place in the room of the charter idea for Republicans and Democrats and people like me who don't believe in either one of them. <laughs> but if we care about kids, even when it is uncomfortable, we must stay in the room. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. I will stand next to you when you fight to lift the cap on charter school growth, but I will fight you when you support voter ID. I will stand next to you when you fight more funding for charters, but I will fight you when you oppose increasing the minimum wage. 
I will stand next to you when you fight against stifling regulations against charters, but I will fight you when you oppose health care and mental health services for poor people, including our children. And I will not mince words on these issues, and I don't expect you to mince words either. This is America. And at times, our interests will converge. And at other times, we got to fight. No, we can't just all get along. But the needs of our children dictate that we stay in the room and find common ground on what we agree on, the value of charter schools. Now, Now, some of you may be asking, other than where did they find this dude to do this speech? Some of you may be asking, why did he talk about this at our charter school conference? I brought these issues up for three reasons. Number one, the issues of health care, jobs, voting rights, and mental health services have a direct impact on the circumstances of living for so many of our children who attend charter schools. They directly impact the readiness of children to learn when they get to our schools. The trauma that our kids experience from the lack of resources, the violence in their homes and in their communities are factors in the disciplinary issues that surface in our schools that hinder learning for all of our students. The second reason is I must speak for the millions of my brothers and sisters who will never have this type of platform to speak. I am duty bound to speak for them and to speak clearly without being scared and mealy mouth. In Derrick Bell's book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, number three, he said that racism is permanent, but we must fight against it anyway. We must stand and fight when we see injustice in order to maintain our sense of our humanity. I must stand and fight on certain issues, even if at least on a temporary basis, it may split us on charter schools, and I must fight even when victory is not possible. I must stand and fight, because not to do so is to co-side on the injustice. I must raise my voice for what I owe my ancestors, what I owe this generation, and the generation that is yet to come. I must fight. I don't know what the next 25 years will bring, but what I do know is it will be a fight. I remember something Cy Flegel said many years ago. We picked this fight when we told the traditional system that we could do it better. People who support the traditional system are, of course, going to fight back. When you pick a fight and the person hits you back, you can't start crying and whining and running home to your mama. I have always been encouraged on this front by the words of the French Impressionist Claude Monet. He said that resistance is always proportional to the scale of the change being attempted. The progress of change can be measured by the intensity of the resistance. And so as I close, a warning. As the years go by, it will become increasingly difficult to maintain a sense of purpose. I believe deeply we must always stand for purpose and not for the method to get to purpose. We must support charter schools as long as they work for our children. We cannot, we must not 
get caught up in protecting ourselves, not because we're serving kids well, but because we exist. If we are not careful and we are not vigilant on this account, we will move from being reformers to being protectors of the new status quo. So I say to you, if we are truly committed to the big ideas that will lead to a brighter future for our children and for the families of the children of the disinherited, then we must understand that it has to be a struggle. Because if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And those of us who profess to favor freedom but yet deprecate agitation are people who want the crops without plowing up the ground. We want the rain without the thunder and the lightning. We want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. And this struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, but it must be a struggle because power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And people may not get all that they pay for in this world, but they most certainly must pay for all that they get. Show me the exact amount of wrongs and injustices that are visited upon a people, and I will show you the exact amount of wrongs and injustices that are endured by these people. And these wrongs and injustices must be fought with words or with blows because the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. God bless you. Thank you very much. And we're going to be all right. <laughs>